the uh, Information Policy Census and National Archives Subcommittee uh, will now come to, to order. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing entitled the 2010 Census Integrated Communications Campaign uh, Criteria for Implementation Measurements for Success. Uh, today's hearing has a twofold purpose. We will begin the hearing with an update of census operations from Dr. Groves, uh, our new census director. This is Dr. Groves' first appearance before the Information Policy Subcommittee, uh, so welcome, Dr. Groves. Uh, after Dr. Groves' presentation, I will have questions for Dr. Groves along with the ranking minority member. Uh, in the second part of the hearing, we will hear testimony regarding the 2010 Census Integrated Communications Plan uh, from our entire panel and proceed uh, with questions from members in the usual format. And without objection, the chair and the ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements after Dr. Groves' update of census operation. All other members seeking recognition will hold their opening statements until the second part of the hearing uh, where they can make opening statements not to exceed three minutes. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Uh, let me start with an introduction of our new census director, Dr. Robert Groves. Uh, President Barack Obama nominated uh, Robert M. Groves for director of the U.S. Census Bureau on April the 2nd, 2009. And Dr. Groves was confirmed by the Senate on July 13, 2009. Uh, Dr. Groves began his tenure as director on July 13, 2009. And Dr. Groves had been director of the University of Michigan Survey, Survey Research Center and research professor at the Joint Program in Survey Methodology uh, at the University of Maryland. Dr. Groves was elected a fellow of the American Statistical Association in 1982, elected a member of the International Statistical uh, Institute in 1994, and named a National Associate of the National Research Council, National Academy of Sciences in 2004. Uh, Dr. Groves was the Census Bureau's Associate Director for Statistical Design, Methodology, and Standards from 1990 to 92. In 2008, Dr. Groves became a recipient of the prestigious uh, Julia Shiskin Memorial Award in recognition for contributions in the development of economic statistics. Uh, Dr. Groves has authored or co-authored seven books and more than 50 articles. Dr. Groves' 1989 book, Survey Errors and Survey Cost, was named one of the 50 most influential books in survey research by the American Association of Public Opinion Research. His book, Non-Response in Household Interview Surveys, with Mick Cooper, uh, written during his time at the Bureau, received the 2008 AAPOR Book Award. Uh, Dr. Groves has a bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and master's degree in statistics and sociology from the University of Michigan and also a doctorate at the University of Michigan. Uh, again, welcome, Dr. Groves, and it is the policy of the oversight uh, committee to swear in our witnesses before they testify. Would you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. And uh, let the record reflect that the witness, the witness answered in the affirmative. And Dr. Groves, uh, would you please proceed? Be sure your microphone is on. There you go. There you go. Sounds better. Thank you. Chairman Clay, uh, Ranking Member McHenry, <clears throat> and other members of the subcommittee, I, I appreciate this opportunity for being here. Uh, upon my confirmation, I promised uh, Congress and Secretary Locke that I would spend the first month of my directorship 
uh, evaluating the key components of the 2010 census. So I've, I've done that. Uh, the reason for this, as you know, as this committee knows well, is that uh, the difficulties with the handheld computer development uh, uh, in the middle of the decade required a major replanning. And uh, many things have happened since uh, those events in 2008, but I needed to take time uh, to make my own professional assessment. assessment. Uh, let me give you a sense of how I did this. Before I ar arrived, plans were in development to bring on two consultants, former Census Bureau Director Ken Pruitt and former Principal Associate Director John Thompson. Uh, they are in place. They were in place when I arrived. And I've used them greatly uh, to, to help me on this risk assessment. I've also consulted with members of the National Academy of Sciences panels of, of the census. I've reached out to a lot of key academic scientists around the country and actually around the world with relevant technical skills. I've met with the staff of GAO, of OMB, of the Office of the Inspector General in Commerce. I've, I've talked to project leaders of all our major contractors. Uh, I, I'm meeting twice weekly with MITRE Corporation contractors who offer independent evaluations of major census activities. And then I've had just tons of productive meetings with the uh, administrative and technical leadership within census. This has uh, given me the basis of uh, what I will report today. I have uh, four different kinds of comments. I want to tell you my assessment of the 2010 census as a survey methodologist, uh, the design on paper, as it, will, as it were. I'll go through some external challenges I see facing the 2010 census. I'll go through internal challenges, and then I want to uh, report on changes I've made to census uh, experimental programs. First, uh, let's look at the design of the 2010 census. I can say with absolute assurance as a professional survey methodologist that uh, if I wrote down the design features of the 2000 census next to the design features of the 2010 census, I would take the 2010 census in a flash. This is a better design, and I'm sure most of my colleagues around the world would agree with this. Why do I say this? Using uh, only the short form of the questionnaire is a good idea. This, will, this should help um, encourage uh, public participation. Sending bilingual questionnaires to 13 million households, uh, a first for the census, is a good idea. We've known for decades uh, that supplying people replacement questionnaires if they don't return the first one is a good idea. This should increase cooperation. And you know, I'm sure this committee knows, that there are two new questions in the short form questionnaire specially designed to improve the coverage properties of the census. These are good ideas. Uh, you also know that the master address file was updated, updated throughout the decade, and that should give us a better uh, uh, set of addresses from which we, we do our mailing. A new operation called Group Quarters Validation that's going to go on in just a few weeks should improve the quality of our listings on crucial kinds of houses that are hard to cover, dormitories, uh, uh, multi-unit structures, and so on. And then, as this committee knows uh, better than I, the, the additional funding provided uh, by the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act uh, is making a difference for our partnership and outreach activities in, in a major way. So with this kind of assessment, I say again, it's an easy judgment that we would, that uh, most professionals would prefer the 2010 design, but a superior design doesn't make uh, for necessarily for a superior product. And so I want to speak to a set of challenges that I see remaining uh, for me and my colleagues at the, the Census Bureau, and I'll start with a set of internal challenges. First, the, the replan of the census in uh, 2008 uh, brought on a new leadership team uh, with fewer censuses under their belt that, than we've seen in, in past decade. Decades. This weakness, however, in my judgment, is countered by a, a, a much more formal and open and transparent risk management process that was adopted uh, during the replanning. And to bolster this further, I've decided to continue 
uh, vigorous use of external advisors, both through existing contracts and with uh, John Thompson and Ken Pruitt. Uh, further, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate to have uh, Deputy Undersecretary for Economic Affairs, Nancy Potuck, who uh, was recently appointed, who's a former principal associate director uh, with whom I enjoy consultative uh, relationships. Second, the second internal challenge, uh, like a lot of federal agencies, the Census Bureau has experienced significant retirements in senior ranks. I'm especially concerned about this at the senior mathematical statistical ranks. Uh, while we're trying to aggressively re recruit new talent, uh, I will attempt to bring in some outside uh, uh, talent of that nature. Third, uh, as you know, because of the replanning of the census away from the handhelds for the non-response follow-up stage, we are using a paper-based operations. The control system for those operations is being written as we speak uh, with a talented group of programmers in Suitland. But this phase of development is very tightly scheduled and uh, it's worth concern. As you know, a recent GAO report called for a complete end-to-end -end test of, of this paper-based operation control system. Um, and I've examined that recommendation and met with a lot of people about the testing process for this system. The current plan within the Census Bureau is to have an integrated test of key, of core subsystems of, of uh, the overall design. I asked for an outside review of the definition of what that core meant, and uh, that review satisfied me that the definition does indeed represent uh, what should be tested. There'll also be a large load test of this control system uh, around Thanksgiving, which should uh, attempt to simulate the full operational load. I've also asked that this test include real users at the skill levels of the users of the system during production. I've asked that the testing design include sequential testing of each of the planned releases of the software. We have at Census uh, two simulated local census offices, one at Suitland and one in Stockton, California. There'll be key components of the test to make the test realistic, and I support, support that design. I should also note that we've created an internal review team over the software development, led by our new CIO, Brian McGrath. It also contains the chief technical officer of commerce and other experts. They've already provided value added, in my belief. Uh, three changes have been made based on their input that should improve the overall design and implementation of the software, and I look forward to other changes from the group. The fourth uh, internal challenge is that it, at this day, on this day, we do not yet know the quality of the master address file. We're gonna know that. Uh, in a matter of weeks. When we know that, uh, we will have, I, in my hope, uh, greater assurance uh, that we have a master address file that will serve us well in the, in the following stages. I'd be happy to report to you on, on those findings when we have them. Fifth, <clears throat> I believe there's a current uh, challenge regarding cost estimation and cost control within the uh, decennial census operations and the Census Bureau more broadly. In my belief, we need better cost estimation and control at the Bureau. One finding of the review of the address canvassing operation that you may know about was that the cost models used to estimate to, uh, used to guide the work didn't forecast the total costs completely well. We have to strengthen the cost information and uh, control system within the Bureau. I'm, I'm, we've already intervened in processes to tighten that up for non-response follow-up, which is a very large uh, organ, uh, activity that'll take place uh, in the summer of next year. So these are the five principal internal challenges in, in my belief. There are four external challenges, I believe. One, and the most important for this committee and for me and for all the leadership of the country is 
estimating the mail return rate. What will the American public do when we send them out these forms? Uh, this is a very difficult thing to estimate. This is something I've spent my life trying to estimate, so I know that the difficulty. The reason it's difficult to estimate is that the population has changed in the last 10 years. Uh, in this recession, the vacancy rate of households is much higher than it was in 2000. More and more families are doubling up in houses uh, uh, due to foreclosures and, and other events. The rate of people experiencing homelessness uh, is higher. And at the same time, uh, we have a public debate and attention over immigration issues. And then five, in other surveys that we've been doing, the response rates are declining throughout the decade. All of these things point to some difficulty in estimating what's gonna happen when we mail out forms to the American public. Will they return them? That's a very important thing, as this committee knows, because for each one percentage point misestimation of that, large sums of money are involved in sending people out to follow up. So we have to get that right. That's a big uh, external challenge. Second, <clears throat> we're in a new media environment relative to 2000. You know this well. More and more people get the news from non-traditional sources. Uh, we're doing all we can uh, to, to learn about the blogosphere and how it's going to affect uh, the image of the Census Bureau and the behavior of the American public. We've launched a media response team that's, uh, that's meeting every Wednesday morning to help us uh, get the facts out about census in a way that may benefit uh, the uh, return rate. Third, uh, there's a challenge for which I need your help. Uh, I'm asking uh, members of com uh, Congress and, and all census take stakeholders to, to work with us to ensure that the census is not tainted by intense political debates driving the news media. I, I can't stress this point strongly enough. Uh, if the public believes that the census data are slanted by partisan influence of one side or the other, the credibility of the statistics is destroyed. Once destroyed, uh, the public trust can't be easily or quickly restored, uh, and uh, we're in deep trouble, uh, both as a Census Bureau, as a census, and as a country, in my belief. The fourth external challenge uh, is that we live in a digital environment uh, that raises the threat of internet scams and uh, cyber crimes like phishing and the widespread use of the Census Bureau logo and the brand. I've directed uh, the Chief Information Officer of the Census Bureau to establish a team that unites our IT security officials with experts from the private sector, and I'd be happy to report uh, on this in the near future about how we're going to swoop in on fake websites that appear to be Census Bureau websites during the census. Those are the internal and external challenges. Let me tell you four things that I've done to change uh, features of the experimental program in the census. Uh, number one, uh, the first concerns uh, the census coverage measurement program, which is used to measure differential undercount. Uh, as you know, this design has come under some criticism by the National Academy of Sciences. And that has to do with the very late interviewing start. This is the mechanism by which we measure the quality of the census. I've, uh, I'm concerned about the quality of the recall of where people were in April, on April 1 when they fall into the sample. I'm concerned about the quality of the matching operations. I have uh, brought together a group of statisticians from around the country to give us advice about how to beef up the quality of the measurement of the census coverage program at the risk of the sample size of this. This is a trade-off decision, but in the professional judgment of the statisticians that uh, I've been consulting, it appears that we can build a better quality estimate of the census if we cut some of the sample and put more money into the quality of the measurement. Second, we'll develop uh, a master trace project that will follow cases through the census cycle. This will be a research tool to understand the, the trade-off of uh, operations and the quality impacts. 
Third, we will mount an internet measurement, a re-interview study uh, for the census that will focus on how people behave differently when they fill out a web questionnaire versus a paper questionnaire. This will be a, a critical component of looking forward about how we use internet measurement. And then fourth, we will mount a post hoc administrative record census using administrative record uh, data systems we have within the Census Bureau, micro-linking them to returns in the census to ask the question, if we had done an administrative census in 2010, what kinds of people would have been included? What kinds of people had been missed? Uh, and how are the data reported? How are the attributes of people reported versus their self-reports uh, or comparing their self-reports to administrative records? So I've gone through internal and external challenges and also have given you four changes I've made. Um, the internal challenges, the uncertainty that I'm most concerned about are the programming uh, tasks on the paper-based operations control system and the not yet known quality of the master address file. But I, I want to emphasize this as strongly as I can. These uncertainties, uh, Mr. Chairman, are swamped by the uncertainties about how the American public are going to respond when we send out this questionnaire. And is this that we should focus on, I think, as the leadership of this country, because this is the single most important thing we can coalesce around to improve the quality of the census. Uh, my clock is not working, and I don't know how I'm doing on time. Uh, you're doing just fine, Mr. Okay. Director. Let, let me say a few things about the communications okay. uh, plan, and uh, let me know if I'm going too long here. I want to turn to the integrated communications plan because I, I know you're, uh, you're interested in this. Um, you know why this is important because it's a chief tool to improve the uh, mail response rate, to address differential undercount, and uh, to assure at that last stage when we send out enumerators to knock on doors that people will understand why they're there, why they're there and will cooperate with them. Now, I understand before I came on board, the subcommittee had a briefing on this program. I think it was the last spring. Um, so I won't go over the entire program, but we'd happy to, I'd be happy to give you a, a more formal uh, briefing later if you want. I directed uh, Associate Director Steve Jost to do a complete scrub of the communications campaign when he came in there. He, he was there a little before I was there. Uh, and the goals of this program articulated at that point were to target traditionally hard to count and link linguistically isolated groups uh, to improve their mail response rates but also to help increase the overall mail response rate in order to reduce the workload on the non-response follow-up operation. A non-response follow-up operation that I remind us is now a paper-based, uh, pretty labor-intensive operation. In addition, uh, there was in place an academic assessment panel, and we used them uh, to, to give us guidance and feedback and ideas to improve uh, the communications campaign. And then, as I've already mentioned, uh, through the ARRA money, uh, $100 million was added uh, to advertising uh, activities. Uh, we can increase our paid media efforts with that extra money, including uh, $43 million specifically for local advertising buys. The, the balance of those stimulus funds will be directed to partnership support, to public relations, to the census in the schools program that I think you've been briefed on already, and to the implementation of a 2010 census road tour. Uh, with that additional funding in uh, adjusted dollars, uh, we're now exceeding the scope of the 2000 census communications campaign. Moreover, uh, because funds are available in fiscal year 2009, which can be used for the advanced purchases of advertising time, these funds are expected to provide uh, greater exposure of the uh, Census Bureau's message than in, in 2000. 
And uh, there's a reason for this. More of the money, proportionally more of the money is targeted to low re uh, response areas than was true in the 2000 effort that was more nationally targeted. Uh, at this point, uh, the uh, non-response follow-up media buys haven't been fully planned, negotiated, or bought, uh, but our target frequency is more than five contacts over the course of the non-response follow-up campaign. Uh, if our estimates are right on this, the American public will see the Census Bureau image and get the message many times throughout this campaign. It's multi-targeted, multimedia, multilingual, and, and uh, to my uh, joy, research-based. Uh, one part of the plan already in place is to allow, uh, will allow us to assess and respond to uh, potential issues stemming from the replan. And that is a continuous tracking and monitoring system. So this will be an advertising campaign uh, for which we'll have ongoing near real-time data of how things are going. Money has been held back to retarget if we need to focus on areas that are uh, 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 showing unexpected results. Let me give you a kind of a hit parade of the things that uh, uh, are the features. We've expanded the number of languages in the paid advertising campaign from 14 to 28. We've revamped uh, the website uh, that'll actually go live in a few weeks. I urge you and your staffs to, to look at this when it's live. It should be kind of cool. We've upgraded the Census in the Schools program, expanding it from K to 8 to K to 12. Uh, in 28 different languages. We've expanded uh, the plans and the scope of the census road tour, something that was quite successful in 2000. We've doubled the sampling of the National Partnership Office and they're working together uh, with uh, their colleagues in, in other functional areas at, at the Bureau. And then we've expanded our language assistance programs uh, in a variety of ways using an advanced letter and other tools. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member McHenry, uh, you asked in a recent letter, I think it was September 9th, uh, that uh, you sent to me for updated budget estimates for advertising among the specific population groups. Uh, we are in the middle of uh, setting, uh, of, of seeking RFP responses and, and, and setting, uh, trying to achieve those targets. We're reviewing and finalizing the creative decisions for use of the ARRA money. And we're in the middle of, uh, or we're launching media negotiations uh, for national and local advertising uh, buys. Uh, we think by late October, or early November, we'll be in shape to give you all of the details that you deserve and you'd like to know and be happy to meet with you uh, at that time. Those are my remarks. I, I'm happy to be here with you. And uh, I thank you for your interest and be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Grove. Let me uh, uh, go to, to the ranking member now. Um, uh, we will each ask a series of questions, and then we will, we, we will then call the rest of the panel forward. So I'll recognize Mr. McHenry. Now. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, and it's uh, nice that we can have a bipartisan hearing, and we're bo all equally interested in uh, what the Census Bureau is doing in terms of communications um, and preparing for Census Day, which is just over, well, just six months away, less than six months away. Dr. Groves, congratulations um, on your appointment and getting through the process. And Thank you, sir. We're very happy that you're at the Bureau, and uh, we welcome you before the committee. Thank you. Um, and I also do want to take a moment and, and thank you for your decisive leadership when it came to the issue of ACORN. Um, this was an issue that uh, not all of us have raised, but I, in particular, raised it uh, repeatedly um, before your appointment. And my concern was what you mentioned um, in your testimony about other things is the credibility of the Bureau and um, the brand, the census brand, and, and its use by other organizations. Um, and so I commend you for your decisive action there. I know it uh, hasn't won wide acclaim, but I think it's important uh, to the integrity of the census. So thank you so much for that. Um, well, 
we've, we've my staff and, uh, and the chairman's staff, uh, as well as the subcommittee's uh, staff, um, have heard from the Bureau. Uh, they were briefed uh, by the Bureau on what happened with the address canvassing and how successful that was. They said at that time that, that, that there would likely be a report in early November. Is that still the case? I know we're doing the analysis and processing on that file right now. Um, we're, we've, we've increased the kind of diagnostics we're seeking out of the file. Uh, whether that date is exactly the right date, uh, we'll certainly have information about that time and we'd be happy to share with you as soon as we okay. have it. This is a very important component, as you know. This have got to get this thing right. Now, you, you mentioned in your testimony uh, what that master address file uh, looks like, whether it's how valid it is and how strong it is. Does that relate back to the, uh, the canvassing uh, results? Yeah, as you know, the, the process we go through is a pretty open one. We seek input from local areas for addresses that uh, uh, they, they know and, and, and uh, want to add to that unit. So we went out, add to that file, we went out and uh, believe it or not, visited 145 different uh, address, 145 million different uh, ad addresses in the country. So every address in the country basically was visited. Uh, on 98% of those, we took GPS coordinates to help locate them. And we verified whether we could find the unit uh, forwarded. And when we had trouble locating the unit or couldn't find the unit or it was uh, missed in space, it was misgeocoded, as we say, then we made a note of that. Uh, and that process uh, will identify uh, some of those could not be found. They were, they were uh, a, a common... Uh, uh, reason for that is that there is a plan to build a subdivision, a small subdivision. Building permits may have been let, and in this recession, the houses weren't yet built, but they're planned to be built. And in those kind of cases, we would mark those uh, for potential delete. We actually keep the records on the file, but we wouldn't be part of it. Wouldn't be part of the mailing operation. So uh, that process is pretty pretty massive. Uh, and, but it's likely your target date is sometime in November to, to sort of uh, have I could, this. I could get you an exact date on this. I promised okay. that we'll get back would to you. Would you be willing to come, come back before We'd the be end of the year and testify this. about it? No, th this is kind of information that uh, your committee deserves, and we'd be happy to share it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and we'd hope to have you back, uh, you know, a time or two before March of next year as well to make sure that we're sort of uh, up to date. We know what needs to be communicated and what other members of Congress can help uh, communicate uh, for the Bureau as well. We'd love and to do that. In fact, uh, the, the uh, knowing and getting, our, uh, getting the word out about what are the next operations that we're doing. For example, we're mounting this big group quarters validation operation in just a couple of weeks. We're out there listing uh, for the coverage measurement study. And the more we get the word out through you and, and receive your questions, I think the better, mm -hmm. better the whole country is mm -hmm. for the census. And I'll have additional questions on the communications effort. Uh, but there's one story that a constituent told me. He said that uh, he was working in his yard one day, and an and a individual uh, <coughs> gentleman came by and said, you know, is this your ha Just was walking down the street and had a handheld and said, uh, he said, is this your house? He says, who are you? I said, well, he's, I'm with the Census Bureau, and we just need to confirm your address. And he said, how dare he? I thought, well, actually, he's trying to save you money, so <laughs> he can just mail you something, you can respond back. And so I, the communications effort is going to be um, very important so that when that guy is working in his yard and somebody from the Census comes by, he goes, oh, I didn't mail in my form. So there's some awareness there. Um, and I certainly appreciate that. And, and I think it's the committee as well as uh, Congress uh, on a bipartisan basis want to make sure that we have the money there necessary, the resources there necessary so that we can get the message out and communicate effectively 
across every community in this country as the Constitution mandates. And you, you test, in, in your testimony, your written testimony says, and what you in essence said, one of the findings in our review of the address canvassing operation was that the cost models used to guide the work did not forecast correctly total costs, and we experienced a cost overrun in components of that operation. We need to strengthen our cost information management structures within the Census Bureau. Uh, can you go into further detail about the amounts and, and maybe the components uh, that experience cost overruns? Well, I'd be happy to brief you on the exact numbers, but let me give you just rough uh, orders of magnitude. Um, one of the things that was uh, discovered is I, I don't view as a misestimation of the cost model but an unexpectedly large workload. So the size of the uh, number of addresses that we out went out with was larger than we thought. Now, why did that happen? Well, this was the first decade uh, where we had continuous updates. And so we were receiving from the Postal Service routinely through the decade uh, more and more addresses. And this was kind of the first opportunity to go out there and check all of those. Estimating that was a hard thing to do. and so. Roughly half of the overrun is, is a higher workload. Um, the most troubling part of the overrun from me, uh, from my perspective, is uh, about a $30 million component of the overrun that had to do with uh, a component of work that uh, occurred if we found uh, one of those addresses uh, as a, a potential delete. You couldn't find the address. Then appropriately and to the uh, I, I think to the uh, uh, benefit of the Census Bureau, there were quality control procedures to follow up to make sure that that really was something that should have been deleted. And those were costly operations. So part of the misestimation had to do with uh, not anticipating so many deletes out of the file uh, because in 2000 there weren't as many proportionally. So that was the kind of misestimation. Uh, what we're doing right now because of that, you know, that operation is over. Uh, we, we can't save the money that was spent, but we can put in place procedures to try to prevent such overruns from happening in the future. And there are kind of two things happening now for non-response follow-up cost estimation. We're doing a big scrub uh, of assumptions at a high level, uh, and that will produce a new estimate. And then we're going to bring in folks uh, at the operations level and build what some people term a bottom-up cost model. We're actually going to have two cost estimation procedures. And when they don't agree, we're going to fight about what's the right assumption. And I think that fighting is really a healthy kind of thing to zero in on the cost. Mm -hmm. And so you're, th this is basically what you're going to do for the estimated $15 billion, you know, the billions that are going to be spent next year. Well, you're, this will you're taking be, this model. This will be about a $2 billion component uh, related to non-response follow-up. This, mm -hmm. is, this is the May, June, July big push. Okay. And so there, there are some lessons out of that. One you, you mentioned before uh, is that you had, well, that, that uh, uh, Mr. Metzenborg mentioned, mentioned in his testimony, which was that you had highly qualified uh, applicants and you didn't have to have Absolutely. those additional interviews. And so you could foresee some savings next year on not having to have multiple interviews and, um, in, in essence, um, um, people uh, not wanting to stay with the job uh, or dropping yeah. out. So let me, let me uh, tell you something. I've, I've been going across the regions now, and in every region that I've been to, the story is the same. Uh, this horrible recession we're going through has a benefit for us, uh, and the benefit is more applicants of better quality, and once they're hired, they don't quit. They work as many hours as they can possibly get. This is all very good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, that lesson of address canvassing we got, and it's adjusting targeting for hiring of non-response follow-up, I guarantee you that. Okay, so those assumptions are, are and, and you're going to have some more estimates uh, going forward for this committee? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. We'd be happy to share things with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is tough work. I don't, I don't want to say it's easy uh, because you're making predictions about future behaviors that you can't really observe. Uh, but we're going to do it honestly. We're going to use multiple methods and we'll 
See, well, I thought that was a career you've chosen for yourself. Well, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it is a career. Estimate, <laughs> Estimate yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as a as a component of this, are there any any specifics, any specific ideas uh, for controlling these costs that you that you could give us as an example? Yeah, I, there's a real easy example on the thing we were just talking about. Okay. Yeah. Um, Every survey organization, every census uh, around the world hires more people than they think they need to do to the job, mm. right? Mm. Uh, and uh, we don't need to do as much of that uh, as we uh, thought, thought we did at the time of AGCAN, so we can, we can reduce those, those hiring and training costs uh, in a major way. Thank you. Um, and I was just informed very politely by the chairman is that that little red light does mean something. So uh, <laughs> I, I yield back the no time that I have remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. And your, your colleague, Mr. Westmoreland, kind of more bluntly reminded you. Let me, uh, let me also uh, uh, follow up with uh, how Mr. McHenry started and say that uh, uh, in a private phone conversation, I commended the director uh, for his prompt action that he took with ACORN. Let me publicly state uh, that I agree with the director's uh, position as far as removing ACORN from uh, the 2010 census. You took prompt action, uh, and, it, and they had become a distraction. So uh, very good, and I support you. Su support your actions. Let me um, let me ask you about the uh, what actions do you plan on taking for the non-response follow-up operation uh, to uh, avoid similar cost overruns to those experienced during the address canvassing operation. Anything different? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the first thing to note, and I haven't said it yet today about non-response follow, it's a tougher job. Uh, it's a job that's done in the evenings and on weekends. You have to go to an address when people are at home. Um, and so the, the activities of address canvassing are only partially informative to us about what's going to happen in non-response follow-up. That's just a caution about how difficult it is. Uh, but some of the things we're putting in place uh, are those that will give us more information at a lower level of detail at the, uh, uh, about how in different local census offices, how different assignment areas are responding. Do we need more resources in one place or another? Are local census offices that are using uh, one particular approach or calling at a certain rate more effective than others. What we hope to do is both at the national and regional and local level to have more integrated information near real time uh, to check and monitor progress so that we can uh, deploy resources where they're needed as efficiently as possible. What, what steps are you taking to ensure that the uh, temporary field staffs follow proper procedures uh, for succeeding operations to avoid the problems reported by the IG during address canvassing? Right. We saw the IG report. Um, I, I, I looked at it, and, and uh, uh, these and we accept and appreciate what they're doing. I think I need to say that uh, publicly because I believe it. Um, what, we, what we did with that was to act on that information as soon as we could to intervene. You asked a slightly different question, and that is what can you do at a system level to assure that all the troops at low levels are doing what they're trained to do? Uh, in addition to good training, uh, we have in place, as you know, supervisory and uh, uh, evaluative criteria that if we see workers, especially at this very compressed non-response follow-up stage, if we see workers violating the training guidelines, we can intervene and terminate them very quickly. And we have those management procedures in place. Uh, hiring such a large group of people that we will do is not a simple task. Uh, it will be uh, 
quite likely that one of those people is not following, uh, at least one of those people is not following training guidelines. We, we can't fully prevent this. We can, however, have management structures in place to intervene as quickly as possible, and we do. Let me uh, also, you, you are now in the process of opening an additional 344 local census offices uh, for a total of 494. Uh, how is that process going? Oh, pretty good. Uh, we're, we're on target on, uh, on signing, le you know, this is a massive operation. It's, it's just incredible uh, looking at it. So there are leases involved where we need the partnership with GSA. You have to build out these places. Then you have to, you have to get equipment and furniture in all of them. And this is, this is like a, a huge logistical operation. Uh, I thought a clever thing was done on the initial local census offices. Uh, as you know, one of our subcontractors, Harris, comes in and sets up computer networks. They did a few of the LCOs and they sort of stopped and said, okay, how are we doing? What are we doing wrong? How could we do this better? And retooled slightly, and then they're rolling that out for others. So, so far, so good. There, we had a few glitches in a certain areas with leases, but those are getting cleaned up, so I'm, uh, we're optimistic on this one. Okay, good. The, uh, the need to comply with um, federal legislation associated with FBI background checks is of s significant importance to me, and I would like to ask you about the Bureau's plan uh, to fingerprint using ink and paper. Uh, hundreds of thousands of enumerators needed for our decennial census. Here's my concern. The use of ink and paper to capture and process fingerprints is highly prone to error and rejection. Uh, I have heard up to 40% of all fingerprints taken by trained personnel uh, can be rejected, uh, causing delays and, most importantly, the inability to comply with federal legislation governing successful passage of an FBI background investigation. Has the Bureau considered using electronic fingerprinting as an alternate method uh, to capture the, the fingerprints for processing and comply with the law. Well, I, I wasn't there, obviously, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, but uh, I've been briefed on a review. Uh, there, there was indeed, uh, and I could get you a report on this if you want, an attempt to evaluate the purchase of uh, electronic measurement devices. The cost of those uh, for a, a uh, an effort as massive uh, the, of the hiring that we're going through was judged to be not worth the quality enhancement or the speed enhancement. And so in a way, the address canvassing operation was a test of this uh, paper-based uh, fingerprinting. And let's evaluate the test. So uh, I'm told going into this, instead of the 40% figure you just cited about rejects, we were anticipating about 30%. Uh, the, the actual number was 22%. And when we diagnose, so why, 20, why should we put up with 22%? Can we do better? There are people working on improved training for the people taking the fingerprints on this. This is two cards, uh, two separate cards were taken per person to see if we can get better at that. The other part of the cost has to do with FBI processing of these things. So we're concerned, can the FBI handle the big load? We're going to have a lot of fingerprints going through the FBI process in a timely fashion in order to uh, be compliant with the law. And we're doing a big load test on that in a few weeks, uh, mid-October, to basically simulate the full workload of the census fingerprintings. We're going to shove that much through the system and, and, and then get uh, a, an FBI judgment that they can or cannot come through on that. So we'll see. Uh, well, mid uh, Director Groves, please share with this committee uh, your documentation and comparisons of the fingerprinting because uh, I have contrary information that says it would be a savings of 10 to 20 million dollars on the part of the Bureau if you use electronic fingerprints. So 
Let's share the yeah, documentation yeah, but, no, with this to do subcommittee. That. And, in fact, if you have some really yes. much, much uh, uh, cheaper uh, method that has the quality we're after, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, well, let's, let's do some comparison okay. shopping great, here. Great, great. And, and, Be happy and to determine do it. If, if we can serve, save the taxpayer some money. Uh, in response to, Rep to Mr. McHenry's uh, inquiry about future hearings, we do plan on inviting the director back uh, for um, um, updates as well as, as, as other subject matter, uh, and, and in particular for a future hearing. Uh, I, it's my understanding that there has been a political uh, thawing about sampling that we may need to explore uh, in a bipartisan manner. So that could be a future hearing too. <laughs> Uh, as he, and, are you smiling as and, you say and, that? Yes, I sure? am, but not facetious. <laughs> uh, let me let me now uh, call the, uh, the 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 two additional witnesses up to the table. Yes, sir. Could, could I have about five minutes just to ask a couple? Mr. McHenry said we we're going to get ten minutes. I'm mean, at fifteen minutes aside, and I think he took ten. Yeah. Yeah. That that was not the format, but I, I'll tell you what I'll. I'll uh, give you uh, I'll uh, give you five minutes. Okay, okay if you'll you, do that, Mr. Chairman. You're gonna Chairman. take five of his. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. If you don't mind, if Mr. you don't mind me doing Westmoreland, that, Westmoreland, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, and just a couple quick comments, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. But uh, Dr. Groves, I want to tell you that uh, I, I, I appreciate your sincerity in the meetings that that we've had. Uh, I think you are very sincere about giving the American people the best count possible and and, uh, and Mr. Jackson the same thing uh, in the meetings that we have uh, and you were talking about the uh, people under you uh, I think people that work for somebody or work for a corporate group <coughs> look at the sincerity of the people that are leading them and want to do uh, that same type of job so I commend you uh, you. for that appreciate and that. I also want to say that you're exactly right on the credibility we cannot, uh, uh, we have got to make sure that the public understands that uh, we're going to count everybody. We're going to do the best job that we can counting everybody. I want to encourage you to look at uh, letting members of Congress do some PSAs, uh, telling people to fill out their form. Every, every meeting I have now, I tell people, please fill out your census and send it in, and if you do that, uh, we'll have a good, accurate uh, count. And we'll save the taxpayer money. Yeah, and we'll save the taxpayer's money. That's correct. Oh, uh, quick question. I know that uh, early this month uh, our staffs were uh, briefed by the Census Bureau on the address canvassing, as uh, Mr. McHenry um, mentioned. They they said that the handhelds work well. Do you, do you agree with that, I mean, from everything that you've yeah, I, I, the way I say it is that they uh, worked well enough for that task. You know, we trimmed the task a little. We took the large blocks and we didn't use the handhelds for the large blocks because we knew they were having trouble with the large blocks. So I think it's uh, the way I'd prefer to think of it. The way we used them, they worked well. Okay. Well, I know that um, they were used for this Jeep. PS, you know, the address, and what's the problem if they work well in, in the environment that you say, could there's, there's no way they could have been used to get the responses for these uh, 10 questions of people that go yeah. out for a non-response follow-up, because I know that uh, at least in the estimations, I believe, in the non-response follow-up, if we were able to use these handhelds, it would have saved a little over a billion dollars of taxpayer money. Now, I, I see the appeal of this. Now, I'm, I'm with you on the logic of your, your question. And uh, uh, the disappointing answer, I think, is that uh, although they were useful for address canvassing, the questionnaire use of those things is another software leap uh, and they weren't ready for that. And indeed, the replanning was motivated by that knowledge. So that, that programming was stopped. You know, they're just mm. not ready for that. They're also not the kind of GPS devices that you and I have may, may have in our car, right, that 
say, right. you know, turn left and so on. Uh, they allow us to put spots on maps and encode those coordinates, but they're not really navigational devices in the way that you could imagine being used in non-response follow-up. And then the killer final point is there aren't enough of them. Even if, you know, even if those two things were, were solved that I just mentioned, we don't have enough of these devices to run non-response follow-up if we wanted to. So, you know, you... It is regrettable, uh, but it is a matter of fact that using those in non-response follow-up is not a prudent thing. Well, you know, and that's a real shame because uh, taxpayers spent a lot of money buying those things, and uh, it would have been great if they could have been used for the non-response follow-up and those simple answers. But with that, Mr. Chairman, if I have any time left, I'll uh, yield that to Mr. McHenry. If not, thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Westmoreland. And now we will uh, uh, proceed under the, the, the normal operations of, of the hearing uh, and ask the two witnesses to, for, to come uh, forward. Uh, we will now, and, and as I stated earlier, and without objecting the chair and ranking minority member, will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements, uh, not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement of extraneous material for the record. Uh, I will now introduce the rest of our panel. Uh, we have heard from Dr. Groves, who I have already introduced. Our next witness will be uh, Judith J. Gordon, who has served in executive leadership positions within the office of Inspector General since 1994 and became uh, responsible for audit and evaluation in June 2008. In her current position, she is responsible for the audit, evaluation, and oversight of Department of Commerce programs, organizations, operations, and management, as well as external activities funded by the Commerce uh, through contracts or financial assistance, such as loans, grants, and cooperative agreements. Prior to this appointment, Ms. Garden served 14 years as Assistant Inspector General for Systems Evaluation, where she led a staff responsible for the review, technology, uh, um, review and oversight of commerce information, technology systems, policies, programs, and contracts. Uh, Ms. Gordon also served as Director of OIG Systems Evaluations Division from 1991 to 94. Ms. Gordon received a BA, a BA in economics and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Michigan and completed the coursework for the doctoral program in economics at American University. Our third witness will be Mr. Jeff um, Tar Tarkasian. I got it right, Tarkasian, <laughs> Executive VP of Draft FCB, uh, the prime contractor of the 2010 Census Integrated Communications Campaign. I want to welcome our entire panel to this hearing, and as is the policy of the committee, uh, we swear in all witnesses. Would you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. The yellow light will indicate that it is time to sum up, and the red light will indicate your, that your time has expired. Uh, Dr. Statements, you want to make at I'm this time? I'm happy to hear the testimony of my colleagues. That will be good. Okay, Ms. Gordon, you may proceed with your opening. Sure, your microphone is on. Push that button. There you go. Thank you. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the Census Bureau's management of next Ms. year's... Ms. Gordon, would you pull the microphone closer to you? There you go of next year's decennial census and communications campaign. We recognize the challenges faced by the Bureau in this enormous yet critical task. Oversight of the 2010 census has been a top priority of the Office of Inspector General. 
Today I will focus my remarks on three areas. One, the significant issues we have identified over the past decade in key census operations. Two, the problems discussed in our first quarterly report to Congress last month. And three, our ongoing review of the Bureau's communications campaign and partnership program. Over the past decade, we have found critical shortcomings in such areas as contracting, address lists, systems development, and enumerating hard to count populations. These challenges remain to this day. Our audit of award fee and contract type on field data collection automation resulted in several improvements when the contract was renegotiated. This occurred after the well-publicized decision to abandon use of handheld computers for non-response follow-up. We have focused considerable attention on address canvassing as this is key to a successful census. In our observations nationwide, we found essential procedures not followed. The Bureau quickly directed the field to correct the problem, but at that point, over half of the operation had been completed. Quality control is critical to identifying and correcting errors when address listers do not follow procedures. While our review is not yet complete, we found that quality control employees were unable to make certain address list corrections when needed. Our first quarterly report to Congress examined the, Bureau, the Bureau's program management limitations. While risk management has improved over Census 2000, specific limitations in program management systems and data hamper its ability to plan and manage the Census. Examples include the lack of integrated objective measures of cost schedule and progress, unreliable cost estimates, and late risk management activities. Further, uh, Census stopped reporting the risk associated with its handheld computers as a key issue in its monthly status reports to Congress, the Department, and OMB, even though the issue had not been resolved. This lack of transparency cast doubt on overall reporting accuracy. Finally, we have been monitoring the Bureau's communications campaign, including its contract, as well as the partnership program. While we continue to assess the challenges, the Bureau's management appears to be going well. We have, however, noted some delays in getting promotional materials to local offices. The partnership program is a related component of the communications campaign. Uh, Census used $120 million in Recovery Act funding to hire an additional 2,000 individuals to increase partnerships in hard-to-count communities. We will be looking at how well Census uses its vastly increased partnership staff. In conclusion, the Bureau is taking positive steps to increase the mail response rate and participation of hard-to-count populations. With the limitations in its project management systems, Census faces significant challenges in assessing progress and forecasting cost and schedule overruns for the duration of the decennial. Major areas we intend to watch going forward include the quality of the master address file, the use of the communications campaign and partnership staff, the Bureau's progress in developing automation for non-response follow-up on a highly compressed schedule and components of the enumeration process. Mr. Chairman, this completes my summary and I would be happy to respond to questions. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. You uh, don't, don't worry about the clock. You did fine. You did well. And you are under five minutes. Uh, Mr. Tarkasian, you are next. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee, Team Census 2010 thanks you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the integrated communications campaign for the 2010 Census. I am joined today by a colleague at Draft FCB, Mark Hall, but I also want to recognize the contributions of our subcontractor partners without whom this campaign would be impossible to execute. A few of them are Global Hue, DXPosito, Global Hue Latino, IW Group, Allied Media, and G&G &G Advertising, who have all tirelessly worked on behalf of the campaign. The topic you requested for today's testimony is Criteria for Implementation, Measurement of Success. From the very beginning of the contract, literally all of the activities that the team has been focused around have to do with achieving successfully the three goals of the campaign. And just to remind us, they are increasing the overall mail response, delivering an accurate census and reducing the differential undercount, and finally encouraging cooperation with enumerators. 
everything that we are doing has begun aligned with those goals and everything we continue to do remains aligned. Absolutely everything we have done is research-based. Our approach to ensuring success has been to listen and learn from others and incorporate that learning into the campaign. For example, learning from the consumer through very extensive quantitative and qualitative research. We've had two phases of communication strategy testing, two phases of creative concept testing, the Census Bureau's own segmentation analysis, our census barriers, at attitudes, and motivator studies have all contributed to a vast amount of consumer knowledge. Learning from the opinions and knowledge of stakeholders, uh, that of advisory committees, uh, that of oversight, including members of this committee, Congress, Senate, and the Department of Commerce. Learning from analyzing the 2000 census program and its achievements. Learning from the Census Bureau itself. The fresh perspective of new leadership at the Bureau, uh, as well as field, headquarters, regions, and local offices. We've had extensive learning from third-party sources, and I'll just name a few of these, from Simmons Market Research, Pew Research, Competitrack, and Yankalovich, and learning from the recent Academic Assessment Panel Report and its recommendations. And finally, uh, there's the learning from each other uh, and our own professional experience in developing and implementing integration communications plans. So we will continue as a team to do whatever it takes to listen, to learn, and incorporate into the campaign what we need to make it successful. So that when the final comprehensive evaluation of the campaign is done by NORC, it will be apparent how the campaign has driven the successful achievements of its goals. Today, I'm pleased to report that we remain on track uh, to deliver the campaign to the marketplace in January. We are on budget and we thank the government for the infusion of Recovery Act funds, which, as the director has outlined, has helped in many ways to expand this campaign and make it more pervasive. And also, we are on track to deliver the very aggressive small business subcontracting goals of the contract. We have just completed the second and final round of creative concept testing and look forward this fall to finalizing all the media buys, the upfront media buy, the national media buy, and the local media buy, and producing all the creative and giving our stakeholders one additional chance to see work in progress materials and plans before implementation. So today, we look forward to your questions, your observations, and advice uh, that you may have about this extraordinary effort and are willing to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for, the, for those presentations. Uh, we will now go to the question and answer uh, period. Uh, and we will start with Mr. Mr. McHenry, who will receive, uh, who will get 10 minutes uh, in each, and, and, and each subsequent, subsequent question here will get 10 minutes. Mr. Okay. McHenry, you're welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, thank you all for testifying. I, I certainly appreciate it. And the overall concerns about the communications effort, I, I raised with the, the Bureau um, back in Jul July, I believe. Um, we wrote a letter about the contract and making sure that we have um, some reasonable congressional oversight uh, over this process. I mean, it, it is, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it has had a substantial increase, and I think I believe rightfully so. Um, you know, I, I think we had uh, about 175 million spent on advertising or communications in 2000, and we're going to have about 260, 270 uh, thousand. I'm sorry, 260 million uh, this time around. Is that uh, approximately right, Dr. Groves? Um, <clears throat> prior to the Recovery Act money, <clears throat> the sum is is closer to sort of 200 million. Uh, the 100 million dollar infusion uh, added to that. So, um, for the advertising it, it, itself, the number of 320 or 322 is is probably the best one to use. Okay. Okay. Um, so certainly, you know, we're talking about. Uh, a, a substantial increase, which, as you noted in your testimony, is um, 
according to what the Bureau thinks is necessary and proper and will have an effect on, on um, lowering the non-response follow-up, the, the need for a non-response follow-up. Um, so, you know, that, that was my question before. I had asked about the draft FCB and the Global Hue contract, um, and we got back basically uh, a quarter of what you sent back, the contract, a quarter of it is redacted. I mean, we basically have blank sheets of paper here um, that are just uh, grayed out, um, and that's about 25 percent well, of what you sent back, and it appears based on uh, you know, some of the few words that are actually here, it's draft FCB's small business subcontracting plan. Um, my question is, is about how we're, Congress is able to provide oversight over this when we can't even get a document um, that is in f full sections being redacted. Um, would you be willing to work with us to provide us with this information? Yeah, I, as you know, uh, Congressman, I, I, I believe the cause of the redaction uh, has to do with uh, the proposer labeling as proprietary some of the information within the proposal. Um, uh, working within those constraints, we'd be happy to do uh, okay. whenever possible. Yeah, and in and, and your letter back to me, you referenced the Freedom of Information Act. Um, which, you know, means any citizen can, can request this information. Um, we, we've actually, Congress has appropriated the money. We're providing oversight. Um, and you reference the Freedom of Information Act in multiple places, saying that you've already, you know, you've released this information under the Freedom of Information Act, and you're basically forwarding me that. That wasn't my request. Um, and I can understand certain sections being redacted of proprietary information, but not 25 pages worth of grayed out material. I've seen intelligence reports that aren't this grayed out. Um, and I'm not trying to minimize this. I, I certainly think it's important, but I, I'd like to have some cooperation so we can provide some oversight and transparency here. Well, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Okay. I, I, I would really appreciate it. And I mean, I, you've been uh, shown every sign of willingness to to, to work um, with all interested parties, and I, and I do appreciate your leadership, and I'm um, not really here to sort of beat up on you on this. I, I just, you know, would like to have some knowledge beyond um, what, what was sent here. I mean, it's uh, almost laughable, uh, the number of redactions we have here. Um, and even furthermore, um, you know, our committee outlines what we, get, you know, what we're requesting um, as best practices, and this is something that the committee puts together. It's not a Republican or a Democrat thing, but it's documents uh, responsive to the request should not be destroyed, modified, removed, transferred, or otherwise made inaccessible to the subcommittee. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, neither the procurement and tra integrity provisions of Title 41 nor the Trade Secrets Acts of Title 18, Section 1905, which is part of what you reference, prevent Congress from uh, receiving proprietary or, or, or procurement sensitive information. So, you know, I, I think providing us with that information is reasonable. Um, additionally, Draft FCB and Global Hue and their parent company, Interpublic Group, have a pretty troublesome legal history. Um, Global Hue is accused of overbilling the Bermuda government uh, 1.8 million, and among other things, it's alleged that Global Hue failed to keep invoices and billing records and charge commissions of up to 181 percent on media buys. Um, what was the process to, to, you know, contract with them? Well, Jeff may want to uh, respond a little on the uh, subcontracting side, <clears throat> but as as I think this committee was briefed, the, the process by which the, uh, the original contract was let followed all of the federal guidelines for acquisition of, of these kinds of services. Um, and there are in place, as you know, uh, Congressman, the, the kind of oversight, uh, financial and service delivery oversight that's uh, specified by, by uh, federal acquisitions. So mm -hmm. those things are in place. 
the reference you're making, I believe, is to an earlier uh, behavior on the part of one of the subcontractors. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, and they also um, draft SCB lost uh, a contract with Walmart over allegations of overbilling, uh, overbilling and Interpublic was fined $12 million by the SEC for accounting fraud. So, Mr. Tark Tarkasian, would you like to respond to that? Uh, let me answer your Global Hue question mm -hmm. first, and then I'll, I'll sure. subsequently answer the other questions. Um, Global Hue, uh, as well as all the other subcontractors who are part of this contract, um, went through a process uh, before we were awarded this contract to identify uh, their expertise, uh, their willingness to work with us, uh, their personnel, uh, the backgrounds of their personnel, uh, their skill set, um, their financial acumen, um, their past experience uh, working on the census campaign, which was important for a variety of the subcontractors. We took into account uh, a whole number of, uh, of factors in putting together our list. Um, the other thing to, to realize is that um, there were a number of other uh, firms like ourselves who were in the marketplace to team up with other subcontractors at the time. So we faced a competitive environment uh, as well as did everybody else uh, in that uh, um, many of the subcontractors uh, teamed up with other players and therefore were one unwilling to team up with, uh, with us or vice versa. So I want to reassure you that we did go through a very rigorous process. The Bermuda situation is something that just came about, uh, was not uh, part of the uh, uh, background when this contract was uh, awarded or when the contract was being put together. Uh, as for ourselves, um, just to uh, set the record straight on Walmart, uh, there was a solicitation by Walmart. Uh, it came out of our Chicago office. Uh, we run this out of our New York office. Um, and our parent company did a thorough investigation of that, and their investigation showed that there was no uh, um, uh, illegal activities, no improprietary activities on behalf of uh, our company relative mm -hmm. to the Walmart uh, contract. Okay, certainly appreciate you addressing that. Um, and for, I guess, the question for you, in general, some of the stuff that I don't see in the contract one standard part is a, a media buying fee. You know, there's certainly a percentage for the purchase of media. What is that percentage you're charging? Uh, actually, by contract, there is no uh, media commission. Media is handled 100% on a pass-through basis. So therefore, uh, the only uh, cost connected with media buying is the actual labor involved uh, with, that, with making the actual buy. But there is no media commission in the contract. Okay, okay. so it's zero. Okay. And th there's just simply a handling fee, in essence, uh, for labor? That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for your testimony, and thank you for addressing those issues as well. Um, and I appreciate you, you taking the opportunity to fully put those things to rest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, Mr. Tarkasian, let me, let me ask you about the uh, – could, could you discuss what the uh, – subcommittee the trade-off between the cost and benefits of paid versus earned media do you do you have any any opinion about that yes um generally speaking um a key difference between paid media and earned media is that in paid media you completely control the message and you control not only the message itself, but where that message is placed, what time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, earned media um, is kind of the opposite. Uh, you place a message out into the marketplace and you try to direct it in a certain channel uh, in the hopes that you do end up uh, with the message expressed the way you'd like the message to be expressed uh, in the channels in which you'd like them to be uh, uh, seen. The value of earned media is that it has credibility that paid media does not have with target audiences because 
earned media is viewed as coming from trusted voices as opposed to paid media uh, where the population knows that the advertiser actually pays to have that message uh, put into programming. Thank you for that response. Uh, how do you respond to members of your um, academic assessment panel suggesting that the grassroots efforts needs to be enhanced as opposed to the paid television uh, media plan? Uh, why not use less expensive media that may be more appropriate in reaching specific groups, especially those hard to count populations? Um, one, of the, one of the messages or one of the recommendations of the academic assessment panel was to step back and take a look at uh, the division of spending, the allocation of money between paid media and the partnership uh, efforts. And as I think many of you know, uh, in the um, Recovery Act funds, uh, there is an increase uh, to the partnership effort, a rather sizable increase to the partnership effort, uh, resulting from the Recovery Act uh, spending. Um, we, we do believe that uh, we are reaching the, the right allocation between partnership support materials, which is what our role is in this, uh, and the paid media spending. Uh, even the paid media spending is dramatically skewed toward uh, ethnic populations, multicultural populations, the hard to count population. In fact, uh, an order of magnitude, um, there is approximately where we're heading is that roughly 20% of the population uh, speaks uh, another language other than English in terms of their consumption of media, uh, but that's actually where close to 60% of the dollars are likely to be channeled, whereas only 40% of the dollars are likely to be channeled against the 80% of the population that consumes uh, media in English. So I think the combination of partnership uh, activities and what is being done in the way the paid media effort is being planned are together surrounding the hard to count populations uh, and motivating them hopefully to participate. Now, w will that include, uh, would those lopsided amounts be included, at, uh, included in, in the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act money also that you, that you all received? The, the numbers that I just quoted uh, reflect the total amount of the base plan plus the Recovery Act together. And what we were able to do so far is take the Recovery Act money and skew it uh, disproportionately toward the ethnic, multicultural, and hard-to-count audiences to, to arrive at those numbers. You know, this is a, a, a real reversal from a couple of years ago. I mean, when things were tighter uh, with the census budget uh, and, and different groups started weighing in uh, with this subcommittee, they were all fearful that they were, they were losing ground uh, in the communications campaign. So you are here today to tell me that it has been reversed and that it is now uh, geared towards um, those hard to count communities. Yes. Uh, the, as I said, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat in, in effect what I've said, that the, that the majority of the paid media allocation uh, is targeted to the ethnic, in language, in culture, hard to count populations. And you see that reflected really as a result of the Recovery Act money. Uh, the increase in the number of languages in the campaign from 14 now to 28 languages. Um, those kinds of things have really, you know, enabled us to make the kind of change that a lot of our stakeholders were urging us to do early on. The uh, OIG responded that the Census Bureau has been, in their words, diligent in monitoring the integrated communications campaign. Uh, but there have been delays in delivery of initial plan and promotional items. Uh, from your perspective, uh, what, what caused these delays and have they been eliminated and will these problems be corrected before the decennium? 
Um, in, in the written testimony, um, I outlined uh, where we are as of today and where we will be shortly by the end of October in terms of delivery of promotional materials and items. And when we had the uh, meeting with the Inspector General back in April, we, we talked about that uh, deficiency and moved very aggressively with our team uh, to get out a lot of promotional materials into the field, uh, which we have done uh, to the point where today I believe there are uh, roughly 11 million pieces uh, that are physical pieces plus uh, uh, a lot of pieces that are on the website that people can download. So there's a full assortment of uh, items that are out there. In, in response to your question specifically about what caused the delay and what has changed since then, um, I think there are a number of factors. One, one is that uh, requirements uh, were difficult to get out of the Bureau at the time. And we went back and forth on requirement setting uh, and I think landed in a place where uh, it was very clear to us what needed to happen. I think our team uh, was not as fast as it could be in addressing some of those requirement changes. And I think thirdly, the review process that was then in place that has now changed dramatically um, uh, led to the cycle time. Where we are today is the Bureau has implemented a review process that is much more streamlined. They have subject matter experts uh, that are assigned to each batch of materials depending upon what the topic of those materials are. And what that has done is make sure that the right content uh, is reviewed by the right person and we get the kind of feedback that we need on a more timely basis. So I think we have caught up, uh, but we continue to push very aggressively on this front to make sure that uh, deadlines are not missed and that we meet the expectations of the field. Very good response. And, let me, uh, and a final question for either you or Dr. Groves. Uh, what is the census plan to, uh, to reach the single unattached mobile person? Is there a non-digital system in place uh, to reach this group in 2010? What is the compelling message for this segment of the population? And is there a mechanism in place uh, to monitor the, the, the Internet uh, in, in respect to the 2010 census? Either one of you. Uh, in in terms, let me start with your, your last point, the monitoring. Uh, I think Dr. Gross talked a little bit about, um, you know, learning about the blogosphere and, and monitoring there. Uh, we have in the communications uh, contract a continuous tracking study that has an internet uh, monitoring component to it. There will be a base wave that will be done this fall and then we will have continuous tracking uh, while the campaign is in the marketplace uh, next year. Um, one of the recommendations of the AAP, the Academic Assessment Panel, was to take a look at the single unattached mobile segment and ensure that there is more than internet advertising uh, to reach that segment. Um, the, the answer is that is something that we are looking at right now. Uh, we had in the plan additional things. They will be exposed to television. They will be exposed to radio. Uh, they'll be exposed to all the multimedia that everybody else is, the road tour and, and all the other elements will reach them. The challenge though is that they tend to be uh, on an index basis less exposed to those media than many of their counterparts. So one of the things in the, the replanning that we are looking at is exactly how to fine tune that plan against that uh, group. And when we share that with the Bureau uh, in October, that can be part of what we ultimately share again with stakeholders later on this fall. Yeah, it, it, it has to be like a high wire act to figure out how you're going to touch this segment of the population uh, when they know there's a, a over reliance on texting, on cell phones, and, and, and other new gadgets that are coming out, it seems like, on a monthly basis. Perhaps. You have something to, to add to it, Dr. Groves, if not, I, I do understand. I think the only, it's actually implied in, in Jeff's point, but uh, on the electronic communication with this population, clearly we have an opportunity to engage our hundreds of thousands of, of partner 
uh, operations because many of them have their own electronic communication uh, with their constituents, if you will. And so if we can be smart about this so that content we might prepare actually migrates to their websites in various ways, that might be an effective tool. Thank you for your response. Uh, Mr. McHenry. Yes, and, and actually it's a nice transition point because, Dr. Groves, you mentioned this, you know, it, it, the Internet measurement you, you mentioned in terms of, uh, of the effectiveness as sort of a measurement tool afterwards uh, to make the next census better. Can, can you delve into that? Because I, I'd like sure. to hear some, some, some of your um, I ideas on ways that we can integrate this, if not this census, then in future. Well, I, I think this census uh, has, has a plan that must go forward the way it is. Uh, mm -hmm. So what what we've added is really an, a little experimental component to answer a, an important, but only one of the questions uh, that are related to looking forward and how the internet might be used. And that is, do we as humans uh, react to questions on a web questionnaire in different ways? And this is part of a much uh, larger research agenda that's going on around the world. There's all sorts of work going on on how you can portray web measurement effectively so that people answer as uh, carefully and as well as they can. That's the focus of, of this particular test. But looking forward, I think it's safe to say, and I think I, I, uh, uh, this is a unanimous opinion in the field, that we, we can't imagine a 2020 census without an internet component. This is actually, I think, a very easy judgment to make. The harder judgment uh, is uh, how do you best integrate it? Uh, and that's hard because you and I don't know what the Internet of 2020 is going to look like. It will not look like the Internet of 2010. I, I think that's a safe bet. Mm -hmm. So all of these new gizmos we have will be old-fashioned by 2020. And the wisdom that we all require, I think, is choosing a course of planning and cycle testing so that we have a use of an internet in 2020 that is uh, the optimal use of that internet of 2020. This is hard. Uh, I, I think uh, we have a wonderful vehicle at the Census Bureau now, the American Community Survey, which could indeed be used more or less as the space shuttle is used to, to add on little experiments throughout the decade to inquire uh, when a new gizmo is created within the internet, is that going to be useful for us to measure uh, the American society one way or the other? And if we're good about this, uh, we, we can choose the right role of the internet. One, one thing that I think is important to note, uh, the findings of survey methodological research around the world on internet use are not particularly wonderful in terms of whether the uh, response rate increases greatly with an internet option. It is the biggest disappointment to my profession right now. We had great hopes that if I offered you an internet option versus a paper questionnaire, you'd go immediately to the internet option. People are not behaving the way we thought. This is a problem for us. So this will not be a panacea for 2020. It should be a useful tool and an armament of other tools, but by itself, uh, at least at this point, the Internet of 2010 is not that tool. Mm -hmm. are, are there, is the inter, is, uh, Internet advertising a component of, uh, of the plan as it now stands? Uh, internet advertising, paid Internet advertising, uh, social media, um, getting our presence on other people's websites, um, you know, any, any way you look at it, being, having a, a strong presence on the Internet, including our own website, uh, is a key component of, of where we're headed. Very good. Very good. Now, you mentioned the American Community Survey. Can you take a moment to, expl to, explain, to explain the American Community Survey and whether or not you think it's effective and important? Well, as, as you know uh, better than most American citizens, uh, uh, Congressman, the American Community Survey uh, had as its seed the long form of the census. So 
uh, a wonderful, as I mentioned in my testimony, wonderful property of the 2010 census is that we're asking Americans to do a much shorter, simpler task than before. Yet, at the same time, <clears throat> this Congress and earlier Congresses have passed many laws that require uh, the measurement of certain attributes of the population in order to redistribute funds. Every question in that roughly 69 question questionnaire has a law sitting behind it that you and your colleagues have, uh, have passed. And that is the tool <clears throat> uh, that allows us to administer those laws, or allow different agencies to administer those laws. Now it has one other benefit, and that is uh, for small business owners, for small town mayors, uh, they were cheated in a way uh, in past census designs. They had wonderfully rich data once every 10 years, but only once every 10 years. And now we're supplying those towns and those decision makers at very small levels of geography more up-to-date information. This is a wonderful, grand, uh, new thing that the society is going to get. It's gonna require a lot of, a lot of education of, of local people on how to use it wisely. So we have a big education uh, task ahead of us. But once it, it soaks into the society, this is a wonderful thing for all of us. All right, thank you for touching on that. There's been some discussion and debate about um, the need for it. And I uh, uh, certainly agree with you that it, it is uh, uh, preferable to the long form. I think uh, it just experience, in terms of the average American's experience, um, you know, and the response rates we've seen, um, and it would be it, it's going to be very fascinating. And I'm sure uh, you, you're interested to see the outcome of of response rates uh, without the long form as a component. Yeah, no, it's going to be fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for addressing those two. Uh, questions that are just of interest to me um, and uh, appreciate your willingness to be here today. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Thank you so much, Mr. Meharry. And, and let me thank the panel uh, for their testimony today. Uh, again, Dr. Groves, it's so good to have you here in this initial hearing. Uh, believe you me, there will be other invitations uh, to come back and we look forward to you coming back uh, we certainly look forward to the uh, uh, to the sharing of information between the bureau and the subcommittee on the fingerprinting issue. Uh, and without objection, I will submit an opening statement for the record and any other members' opening statements for the record. And without objection, uh, the hearing stands adjourned. Thank you. There you go. I almost went over. Said go blue, but I didn't. Right from Becky Blythe. Except oh, there yours there? Yeah, this is how they call us. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it's so uh, heartwarming. It was Ips then. It was Ips then. That's right. Yeah, the '70s. Right. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's so neat. Have you been up there since the building? No, I haven't seen the new building. I should actually. Yeah. No, no. The, the building. Transform the campus because it's the first build.
adventure. Dora Saves the Crystal Kingdom is available now on DVD. New Swiffer Wet Mopping Cloths clean so deep, it's like your old mop's worst nightmare. Love sticks. Love sticks. Swiffer Wet Cloths clean better than a mop. With new cleansers that attract dirt deep into the cloth and lock it away. New Swiffer Wet Cloths clean better or your money back. We created our College of Business and Management after collaborating with business leaders. We wanted our curriculum to match market needs, preparing you for today's most sought-after careers. In fact, we have not one, but five specialized colleges offering you bachelor's degree programs that are both relevant and highly marketable. DeVry University. Discover education working at devry.edu. Another money-saving secret. New Arm & Hammer Carpet Deodorizer plus OxyClean Dirt Fighters. Baking soda eliminates odors. New Dirt Fighters remove up to 25% more dirt. Revive your carpet every time you vacuum. Save more, waste less with Arm & Hammer. You've got good reasons to eat better. So now, 23 Campbell's Chunky Soups have 100% lean meat and a full serving of vegetables. Now this is really going to make your eyes pop. It's Lash Blast, the number one mascara launch in recent history. With six million scooped up already, it's the go-to tube if you crave the biggest, boldest lashes of your life. You'll only find this big brush in Lash Blast. It doubles the size of your lashes right before your eyes. So come on, join the six million and counting. Try Lash Blast, only from Easy Breezy Beautiful Cover Girl. And check out Lash Blast Lux with hints of shimmer. Try all four shades. Expecting for the first time, Lynn Sanders has been enduring debilitating joint pains that her doctor has repeatedly insisted are a natural part of pregnancy. All my joint pain never subsided during the whole pregnancy, but I thought that was normal. After I delivered my son, I still had that achiness all over. But before her body has any time to really recuperate, she finds out she's pregnant yet again. And this time, the agonizing pain seemed to have escalated to a degree that she has never felt before. I thought because of hormonal problems, that would just continue until, you know, your body gets back into normal shape again. But three months after her second boy's birth, Lynn still isn't feeling any better. The pain is constant. She begins to realize that she can't have any more children in this state and goes on the pill. And I think it was kind of a cranky mom at the time because of all the pain that I was having. There was always that question of why, why, is, why is all this happening? What's wrong with my mom? My knee pain was really, really a sharp, sharp pain at the time. I could hardly put weight on it. When Lynn checks in with her doctor yet again, he assures her that the crippling knee pain is simply a side effect of having paper-thin ligaments. The only thing that will help is another surgery. The next day, Lynn is wheeled into the OR. But as the surgeon inspects her knee, he realizes that the damage is far more extensive than they first thought. After completing the complicated surgery, he instructs the team to put her in a full leg cast to help stabilize her fragile knee. I was thinking, how am I gonna take care of two young kids? with a cast this size where I can't bend my knee. After eight days of recovery in the hospital, the surgeon discharges her with strict orders to take it easy. But Lynn is determined to get back on her feet as quickly as she can. And a few days later, she decides to give crutches a try. But as soon as she takes her first step, she notices that something isn't quite right. I was having a little bit of pain in my calf area which was kind of unusual because he fixed my knee. The pain is just getting like worse. By the next morning, her calf is throbbing so badly that Dave insists on driving her to the emergency room. All it takes is one look at Lynn's leg and the ER doctor knows that she's in serious trouble. I was very terrified. I didn't know what to expect. The medical team runs a battery of tests and within an hour, they know exactly what's going on. 
Lynn has three blood clots in her leg. At any point, these clots could break loose and travel up through her blood vessels. If they lodge in a sensitive place like the lungs, it could kill her almost instantly. It was, uh, you know, a, a very dangerous uh, situation. They realized how quickly it could go bad. They thought they could be from my, my birth control pills, so they took me off immediately. Over the course of the next eight days, they keep a close eye on Lynn as they pump her full of blood thinners to help reduce the deadly clots. I just couldn't believe I had to go back for another eight days. When the team is confident that the young mother is no longer in danger, they release her with a 90-day supply of the blood thinning medication. Lynn and Dave are hopeful that the worst of it is behind them. But two months later, Lynn is caught off guard when her body starts to change again. I discover that I'm pregnant. You know, she's in a full leg cast and somehow or another we managed to, you know, do what young couples do and uh, we, uh, you know, she ended up getting pregnant. But the real shock is yet to come. On hearing the news, the doctor recommends that she terminate the pregnancy. He's concerned that the blood thinner she's been taking could have already done serious damage to the unborn fetus. Also, they said I could miscarry because of it. She was pretty broken up about it, and I, I was just trying to be the, you know, there to listen and, and try and understand what it was we were going to do next. Lynn immediately stops taking the blood thinners and begins researching her risks. When she contacts the March of Dimes, they refer her to Luann Week, a genetic counselor. We had some uncertainty about the exact timing of her pregnancy and how far along she was. We really have to pinpoint that timing because it makes a big difference as to what the risks are. The next day, Lynn goes in for an ultrasound and they're relieved to discover that she's only five weeks along. This is good news because the baby was only exposed to the blood thinners for a brief period of time. As we often say in genetics, nothing's 100%, and so we still had to manage and cope with the fact that there was some uncertainty here. But Lynn is willing to take the very real risks, especially when she finds out that she's having a girl. I just broke out in tears because I finally was gonna have my girl. During this third pregnancy, she was in constant pain. I was in more pain than ever, and I was worried about the baby and if she would have birth defects. The stress of it all is almost more than either of them can bear. But in the 34th week of her pregnancy, the couple finally hits rock bottom. All of a sudden, I felt no movement. Here I'm thinking I'm going to have a stillborn or there's something wrong with my daughter. Behind every great queen, We're ready to roll. There's only one king. I need you to smile, sugar. No rhinestone goes unpolished on Cyrus's watch. There's only a few things you gotta learn. You just have to make sure they don't shift, especially when she leans forward. He's the man behind the magic. Wow. We can't put 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. He's King of the Crown. Premieres Wednesday, September 30th at 9, only on TLC. I want one of you to bring home that crown and knock the rest of them down if you have to do it. <laughs> sea salts vary in color and taste. One tops them all. Adding it helps us use less salt than before in Campbell's tomato soup while keeping the famous flavor. So many, many reasons it's so... Performance towels are designed to dry a third faster than ordinary towels, so they spend less time in the dryer and more time where you really want them. Canopy Home Furnishings, now at Walmart. Save money, live better. Walmart. Here at the new Cottonelle Institute of Sensitive Skin Care, the world's top skin expert, here I am, is making sure the gentle care you give to your face works for me. Hands. Remember the elbows. And legs. Mmm, silky smooth. Also goes to your tush. Excellent. With new aloe and e and soothing, clean, flushable moist wipes. Check your own sensitivity profile at cottonelleinstitute.com. Two thirds of women have sensitive skin. Maybe you're one of them. You know, they don't call this a lab for nothing. <laughs> Show off your tickling moves with the. Tickle hands! It's almost tickle hands, the silly hands that shake and giggle every time you tickle. Get up and giggle! 
It's easy to tickle and wiggle. Tickle and move. Elmo's Tickle Hands, only from Fisher Price. Yeah! Boy. A touch can be so calming, but on newborn sensitive skin, it should be as gentle as possible. Now Pamper Sensitive are the only sensitive diaper and wipe clinically proven mild on some of the most sensitive skin. For a calming touch, now clinically proven mild, Pampers Sensitive. Ah, the peaceful and relaxing sounds of nature. If you're still using dial-up because you thought high-speed internet wasn't available where you live, think again. Think HughesNet. High-speed internet by satellite with the fastest speeds ever offered. Why settle for less? HughesNet uses advanced satellite technology, not your phone line. There's no dialing in, no tied-up phone lines, no missed calls, and no more waiting. The key benefit for me is the speed. This is so much faster for me than dial-up was. It's freed up a lot of my time. This is HughesNet. This is dial-up. If you're on dial-up, guess what? You're still waiting. Why settle for dial-up because of where you live? High speed is available today with HughesNet. Get free standard installation when you order now. Call 1-800-624-6809 or go online to 22HughesNet.com. Most of the people in Lynn Sanders' life think she's a klutz. They have no idea that the 28-year-old has persevered for more than a decade with chronic and debilitating joint pain. I had neighbors actually making fun of me, saying, well, what, what are you going to have a cast on this time? Then, during the eighth month of her third pregnancy, the baby stops moving, and the young mother knows she needs help. I immediately went to my OBGYN. He told me that I was in labor, basically, and that I was going to have the baby six weeks early. It's a tense six hours of labor, but on March 18, 1986, Jessica Sanders is born. And even though she's premature, doctors assure Dave and Lynn that she's perfectly healthy. But Lynn is still very worried that the blood thinners could have affected her baby girl in ways that aren't yet apparent. So she checks back in with Luann Week, her genetic counselor. I asked her lots of questions about Jessica's medical history, and every question that I asked um, had a very normal newborn baby answer. Just to be safe, Lynn continues to take her daughter in to see Luann every six months. And each time, she assures the nervous mother that all is well. At Jessica's three-year checkup, it becomes clear that the genetic counselor is far more worried about Lynn than her daughter. Luann asked me, every time I see you, you're in a cast, a different cast. So started asking her a lot more questions about her health history. I felt it was important that I make her aware of a condition that might explain her problems. Lynn can't believe what Luann is suggesting. She spent nearly 15 years hearing that she's just different, but secretly, she's always suspected there was more going on. I was totally desperate for some kind of answer to all the aches and pain that I had since I was 15 years old. Luann advises Lynn to get in touch with a genetic specialist immediately. She tracks down Dr. Pamela Trepain and hands over her extensive medical file. Dr. Trepain begins conducting her own investigation by having Lynn perform very specific tests on her joints. There is a scale that we use to be able to assess joint instability and joint hypermobility. In other words, how mobile are her joints, looking at her skin, how stretchy it is. Based on that type of a physical exam, in addition to her medical history, makes that diagnosis. Lynn has classic features of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a disorder in which a genetic mutation disrupts the patient's production of collagen, a type of protein that acts as a glue and holds our skin, muscle, and ligaments together. Without the adequate collagen, Lynn's body quite literally began falling apart. Lynn's joint pain is a direct result of the poor collagen and the poor elasticity. 
Many children, their parents will describe them as being clumsy, when in fact they're trying very hard to keep their whole body in appropriate alignment. You, you think back and think, well, maybe it wasn't, she wasn't the klutz that you know, we thought she was. It was related to this condition that she had no control over. Dr. Trepain speculates that Lynn's pain progressed slowly from her hands and wrists to other body parts because the joints that are used most often feel the wear and tear first. When Lynn was pregnant, she felt even more fatigued. We're already talking about joints that are unstable, and now you're adding the load of the pregnancy on top of that and a shifting center of gravity. All of those things then will combine to create increased joint pain. Historically, people who had classic Ehlers-Danlos syndrome had incredibly stretchy skin. Within circus environments, you see the people that can stretch their skin, taking their earlobes and pulling them down. You know, one of the big puzzles, of course, for Lynn was why it took so long for people to make this diagnosis. She did not have overly stretchy skin. Unfortunately, what most physicians have learned is that's EDS. While it's reassuring to finally know what she's been living with all these years, Lynn is not prepared for what the doctor has to say next. There is no cure for EDS. We cannot go in and fix the gene that is making the collagen incorrectly. We can, however, provide good pain control and good physical therapy. Lynn begins a rigorous course to strengthen and steady her joints and takes prescription medications to help manage her pain. Unfortunately, she will continue to require surgeries to tighten up her ligaments as they wear out. I'm trying to go and do the best I can each and every day. Every day is a new day. To date, Lynn has had more than 40 surgeries. She also wears custom-made silver ring splints to help stabilize the joints in her fingers. I wear these just to prevent tearing in my ligaments in my fingers. And also, it really does help with pain. Lynn is still coming to terms with the fact that her disease will never go away. But she finds her inspiration to face each day through her husband's unwavering support. It takes a special person to marry somebody and still stand by my side. 33 years since we met. It's for better or worse than sickness and health. And, and that's pretty much what I've stood by. Today, Dave and Lynn remain hopeful for a cure. In the meantime, she's doing all that she can to help patients like herself. In 2006, she started the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome Network Cares. You have to be your own advocate. I hope someday every doctor knows something about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. My name is Matt Roloff, and this is my wife, Amy. We're little people. When you're only four, it wasn't made for you. We have to face obstacles and challenges just to live an ordinary life. Three of our kids are average height, and only one is little. Our oldest boys are twins, but they're definitely not identical. Because Zach is little like us, and Jeremy isn't. The one thing I wish everybody would understand about little people is... We can pretty much do what everyone else does, but just in a different way. And this is our story. Okay, are we for sure going on this cruise, I take it? Mm -hmm. We're going on this cruise, right? Yeah. Amy and I were planning on taking a cruise with a group of little people friends. I didn't analyze the calendar quite correctly and scheduled a cruise that happened to fall in the first week of pumpkin season. We normally would never consider being gone during pumpkin season, but you know, we just don't get a chance to see our little people friends that often. Do you want to go or do you want to get out of it? I mean, I could get out of it probably, but just, it'd be it's brutal. Gonna be, it, it's going to be very brutal. We had scheduled this cruise thinking, sure, we can be gone a little bit in October, why not? Not realizing how big our pumpkin season has gotten. We need to figure that out. Well, let's plan that we're going. Let me worry about life while you worry about whatever it is you worry about. <sighs> right, Matt. Kids. Yeah, let me worry about that. Um, what do you want for dinner tonight? You. Okay, what else do you want for dinner? It wasn't my fault. What? 
Oh, you didn't hear? Okay, never mind. Last pumpkin season, we had these huge crowds with customers kind of wandering all over the font. To manage the crowds better this year, I had my artist buddy, Sven, design a new people mover wagon to take customers on a more of a guided tour around the farm. Okay, let's see, how does it look? Go, go, go down, let me see. Okay. Comes down. The people mover doors were supposed to swing down totally flat so people can get on and off easy. But you know, the way Sven did it, they would only go down like halfway. Let me see how this is gonna come out. Wait, no, no, no lay it down, lay it down. Let's can see I, if you can I just no on because the other you don't side. even know what you're doing. Screw it. Go ahead and just, no, just put it to the side. Give me that one. Oh. Right here. Screw it in. Go no. Okay, just really indulge me. It's just for now. Ready? Now we go up. But why won't it go? Well, What's it binding on? But I indulged you. So I'm gonna take this ridiculous thing off. Now I can do it my way. Ay, 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 ay. Ben and Camerino came up with the idea of building a, a, a dock on the side of the stable. That way we could unload and load our tour customers from the people movers directly into the cowboy count. Closer! 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 You're about a foot away! Closer! 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 Stay! Don't turn away! Don't! No! No, 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 no! No! Stop! Just follow my instructions. Go to the left. You're turning the wrong way if you're going to get close. Go forward. Just give me a chance. What are you doing? All right, stop. Do you expect to do that on every single ride? Yeah, I could do that going 30 miles an hour in that thing. Probably. Come on up. Sven is a great asset to our farm and has been for many years. But he's an artist, and I, you know, I'm constantly trying to push him and move him and, and encourage him. Um, yeah, Matt, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit like, like nervous. No, I'm getting panicked. Yeah, that's it, panic. It's about time you got. I was panicked when I saw you fussing around with the town and go, oh, this little strap got to go here. Oh, no, I can't put this little strap over here. You know. The devil's in the details. Well, when I saw or you doing that, the devil does ago, the details. I was thinking, I'm panicked. And now, now that you're panicked, I'm like, finally. It may look bad to an outsider who looks at our relationship, but truly, we're doing, we're, str we're struggling with each other out of nothing but love. <sighs> Where do I get these people? I'm fortunate enough to have an office manager, Becky, who is really, really organized. Becky was in charge of running pumpkin season while Amy and I were on our cruise. Well, Becky's no-nonsense management style, it was a great balance to my other, more creative and freewheeling employee. Becky had never really managed our pumpkin season before, you know, but we had plenty of veterans like my parents, Pop and Honey, you know, to help out if things got crazy. Look at a folder with my name on it? Yeah. Am I, am I part of this operation? Apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> There's no turning back now. <laughs> Flush there? Yeah, pretty good. Okay. Okay, there. While Sven was working on the people mover wagon, I got my buddies Rodney and Phil to help me get the dock built. This is what I call prototype on the fly. Okay. Okay, stand it up. Okay, scoot it a whole lot closer to the structure. We'll test the theory. What I need Camarina to do is drive around with the trailer a little closer. Okay, so stop right there. What happens when you lower it down now? You want it lowered all the way? Yeah, let's just see. Okay. Oh, shoot. So we'll have to cut those posts. Go grab the chainsaw. All right, now lower that thing down. 
Yeah, every time you pull in, your doors have to fall on here and, and, and marry up with this. Yeah, it's gonna have to be right on the money. That's not gonna leave much room. You don't believe it's gonna work? No, I don't. Discover Lindor Truffles. Crafted by Lind's master Swiss chocolatiers. When you break its shell, Lindor's lusciously smooth center starts to melt, and so will you. 160 years of our passion, all for that one moment of yours. Lindor Truffles, from Lindt. On October 2nd, with just one ticket, experience a double feature 3D event. Disney Pixar's Toy Story and Toy Story 2. You you are a sad, strange little man. For the first time ever in Disney Digital 3D. Rated G. Get wrapped up in the luscious taste of butternut squash. Blended with delicate herbs. V8 Golden Butternut Squash from Campbell's. A soup so velvety and delicious, you won't be able to contain yourself. Campbell's V8 Soups. Can you tell me what's so great about this Alamo kiosk? Simple. Alamo lets you skip the rental counter, check in here, and go choose your car. And that means? That means no lines, no delays. I like you! Drive Alamo, drive happy. The Coffee Mate World Cafe Collection from Nestle. Italian sweet cream, tiramisu, hazelnut biscotti. Three flavors that'll make any moment magnifico. And now try new Belgian chocolate toffee and Parisian almond cream. Nexus Dual East. Dual benefit shampoo and conditioner. Revolutionary color protection plus intense hydration. Finally, color care without compromise. Do at least take your hair to the nexus level. A social situation 